I'd just like to welcome everybody to, uh, to our attempt to try to do an adult forum. Um, obviously, it's uh, God's Earth, Our Hands, that is, is sponsoring this. Good um, morning. <laughs> good morning, Nancy. Way to go. Good morning, Nancy. Our technical expert oh, yeah. right here. Oh, boy, the world's in really big trouble. <laughs> So, um, for those of you that are not part of the team, I just want to in inform you a little bit about God's Earth, Our Hands. It's the newest team at Prince of Peace that was formed in 2019 that uh, we report directly to the council. And we um, formed our group uh, patterned after um, a document called Becoming a Creation Care Congregation that was put out by Lutherans Restoring creation. And um, the purpose of God's Earth Our Hands is to promote within the congregation a commitment and direction for the care of God's creation. The team will provide leadership to the entire congregation, staff, ministries, and congregants in carrying out the care of creation in, following, in uh, the following areas, in, in worship, education, building and grounds, discipleship at home and work, and public ministry. So today's forum kind of fits two of those, education, and um, we're going to talk a little bit about disciple and, and work at home and trying to be better stewards of God's creation. So um, let's see, for those of you who don't know, the members of uh, our team so far are Tricia and Karen, Chris, and Joan Rudolph, and Beth, uh, Tom McNeely, um, Mark Eckblad is help, uh, attended, and Sue Olson. So, and we are always welcoming others to join us. And Jessica Hansen is yeah. number two. Yep. I'm her surrogate I, today. Did I, did I forget anybody? <laughs> it's a big group. Yeah. Yep. So, I am going to. Um, the format of what we're going to do today, I, there's a, a message, a Earth Day message that Bishop Eaton put out, and I am going to read that. And I, think, I think I'm going to screen share it as I read it, just I think it'll be helpful for you to see it too. And then Karen is going to talk about the history of Earth Day a little bit, and then we have, um, we're going to go through the, the 10 things that we all can do to help save the Earth. So... All right, so let me... And then some activities this week. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There you go. There, can you all see that? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I am, I'm just going to read what the bishop has to say to us. So she starts off with a, um, an excerpt from the ELCA social statement, Caring for Creation. Sin and captivity manifest in threats to the environment are not the last word. God addresses our predicament with gifts of forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. By the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God frees us from our sin and captivity, empowers us to be loving servants to creation. And the bishop writes, as I work from home at our dining room table, I look out the front window and see the wildlife at my husband's feeders. God created such beautiful creatures. As Christians, we are guided, guided by the promise expressed in our social statement that we are empowered to be loving servants to creation. It is our duty to care for God's earth. Established in 1970, Earth Day launched the modern environmental movement spurring development of landmark policies for a creation in crisis and defining a path toward a more sustainable planet. In this 50th anniversary year, under the theme, Climate Action, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America is joining the Earth Day Network as a featured faith partner. Hmm. This partnership expresses our deep love for God's creation and the Lutheran understanding of our profound responsibility for it. The social statement describes our commitment in this way. Humans in service to God have special roles on behalf of the whole creation. 
Made in the image of God, we are called to care for the earth as God cares for the earth. God's command to have dominion and subdue the earth is not a license to dominate and exploit. It should reflect God's way of ruling as a shepherd king who takes the form of a servant wearing crown of thorns from the care of creation uh, social statement. The bishop goes on to write, we accept that caring for and protecting creation is central to our holy calling, <clears throat> yet we acknowledge our shortcomings in this regard. Our action and inaction are exposed by the despoiling and degrading of the environment. Affected by human activity, <clears throat> our changing climate has brought more severe weather patterns and ensuing destruction. Our waters, land, and air are being polluted, and we are alarmed by the devastation. Ecological systems are strained to the point where some species cannot adapt and face extinction. Globally, we are dealing with two interconnected crises, the COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic and the ongoing climate change. Both demonstrate the profound consequences of our disrupted, broken relationship with the natural world. According to scientists, species disruption caused by global warming is combined with human encroachment on the natural world to drive wildlife into greater and deadlier contact with people. The COVID-19 outbreak is an urgent warning that our behavior opens the door to transmission of new diseases with devastating consequences. Wow. Our, our distorted relationship with the earth is borne most heavily by the most vulnerable and marginalized among us who are ill-equipped to withstand the impact of climate change or implement remedies. COVID-19 and the climate crisis heighten the existing racial inequity, economic disparity, and social injustices. Our call to care for creation is also a call to right these wrongs. As Earth Day partners and stewards with creation, we have many ways to lovingly serve the earth. And she lists about seven different um, websites that you can go to to um, take some action and things that you can do. That's good. Not quite that far. So looking past the anniversary, we gladly accept the monumental assignment <laughs> of refocusing yeah. and renewing and raising our efforts as we embrace our role as stewards of creation and look with hope and promise towards years to come. And she ends with a prayer, and so let us pray. Prepare us, Lord, for what lies ahead. Give us the strength and dedication that we will need in order to serve others unselfishly. Give us the energy we will need to follow through with the task. Give us strength to face our assignment and put before us people who will support us. Open our ears and eyes and heart so that we can sustain others and help creation recover from this crisis. Bless those who are suffering and give them hope. In Jesus' name, amen. From Bishop of the ELCA. Good. All right. Very nice. Yeah, yeah, that was really good. Let's see. Karen. How do I get back? So now you want to go to Stop us. sharing. No. If you can I help? Oh, you can do it that way. So <laughs> that you can do a new share. There's a button there that oh, says okay. a new share. So you don't have to necessarily yeah. turn so it. I gotta go to share. Oh, I gotta go to share. Yep. Sorry, I'm kind of figuring this out as we go along. You're here. doing a great job. Okay, so um, with that, yeah. I think we'll uh, talk about Earth Day a little bit. And Karen, I think you had some things prepared for us. Yeah, uh, I think Wisconsin can be proud of Earth Day in that our former governor and senator, Gaylord Nelson, was the one who started the Earth Day to begin with. And we're 50 years, so... It started on April 22nd, 1970. <clears throat> and it was a new movement, uh, kind of instigated or patterned after 
the anti-war movement, uh, Gaylord Nelson felt that um, a movement that started locally and at the grassroots level would be one that would be stronger and better than one started from the top of the government down. And I think that's true with many issues we face. Um, it started as a public concern for environmental issues. Uh, Gaylord Nelson had witnessed a catastrophic oil spill in Santa Barbara, California before he started Earth Day. And it, it just struck him as we need to do something about this and other issues as well. Um, in 1962, uh, a woman, Rachel Carson, wrote a book called Silent Spring, having to do with um, the poisoning of our environment, our animals and ourselves with pesticides and herbicides. And that was one thing that got people started to think about environmental issues. Um, Nelson wanted to see that people at a local level could call on the government and our policymakers to do some actions to solve some of these problems. And as I said, he was inspired by the anti-war movement, the teach-ins on the campuses and universities throughout the nation. Um, the first Earth Day, uh, which was in April, on April 22nd, actually they estimated 20 million people participated in that, which was far beyond their dreams. And that included people of in colleges, universities, schools, but it also included labor union people, people of various political persuasions, uh, scientists, uh, old and young. So it, it pulled people in from all directions. Um, it kind of organized itself, actually. Um, it just took off and has continued. And by 1990, we had 184 countries throughout the world um, acknowledging and participating in Earth Day. So it gave a voice and an educational outlet to people throughout our nation and throughout the world. Well, uh, let's see, there's, anyone have something to add to that? We're still going strong. Um, I'm trying to see if I have some data on the current numbers of people. It really is terrific to know it started in Wisconsin. Yes, I think we can be proud of that. Uh, Gaylord Nelson was known as the conservation governor. So he was into this field before he became a senator. But um, as people saw the need for this, they were drawn in. Now he was a senator when he started that, isn't that correct? Yeah. Yep. Right. But in the, in, as a governor, didn't he start the, the land stewardship? Or is that Walt Knowles? Yeah, uh, let's see. I had something here about all the things that came because of Earth Day. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency to oversee was developed. There was a clean air, clean water. Clean Soil Acts, um, 
So a lot of legislation came after and because of this. Because the politicians listened to the people by the millions, you know, who were concerned. You know, what I think is so um, heartening, it was so bipartisan support for all of those at that time, too. And it's not a partisan issue, you know. They tried to sometimes make it such. Right. But, but it... Well, the, the young people who, you know, his movement has spread with uh, the leadership of Greta Thunberg is really reminiscent of how you said it, it spread kind of, um, you know, at a grassroots level, Karen. And she was on um, public radio this morning uh, talking too, as well as some other people who are leading the effort. And I think uh, there's an op-ed this uh, today in the Post Crescent by um, Gaylord Nelson's daughter. Yes, yeah. I heard her speak. She is quite a remarkable person, a very good speaker. And she was very close to her father. I just realized the Nelson Institute at UW Wisconsin Madison must is named after him. Right. And they are doing a um, Earth Day conference tomorrow. Right. That on your list of activities. It is. It's on, I have a link to it on the last page of my PowerPoint. So. Well, another thing is, I think we all have to think about Earth Day is good, but every day is Earth Day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In a way, we have to yep. take care of the environment and treasure what we have and pass it on. Um, they say um, we are not. We did not inherit the earth from our ancestors, uh, but we're borrowing it from our children and our grandchildren. So it's not ours to just destroy and take all we want. It's ours to pass on to future generations. That's a good comment. Very good. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing they, even Martin Luther said, if today were the last day of the world, yeah. I would go out and plant a tree. Right. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. Yeah, I like that comment, on, Ron, on your 10 things to do, what it all said about the benefits of planting a tree. Yes, <laughs> right. I had a uh, bumper sticker on one of my vehicles for many years that said to a forester, um, no, Earth Day is every day to a forester. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of along the lines of what Karen was just saying, that really Earth Day should be every day for all of us. There are some good things we've learned um, from this pandemic that can be applied to the climate change. I think it showed us that um, People can change their behavior for the common good. Um, yeah. We can make sacrifices. We can make adjustments and we can make them really fast if we have to. Yeah. And that's one good point. I think another good point is uh, trusting science and education and realizing that science does take time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have an answer to everything just like the vaccines immediately. But um, I think people are paying more attention to science now than maybe the politics. At least, I hope so. Yeah. So over the last year, um, I've kind of 
gone into panic mode about climate change <laughs> and um, started getting involved with some organizations and thinking, well, really what I do individually is I, I got to work on it from a governmental and institutional and business perspective to really affect some change that needs to be made immediately. But I have been reminded since being on this team that yes, indeed, what we each do individually makes a difference. And so we thought we would provide these 10 things that um, was put together to uh, try to make, you know, that kind of challenge each of us to make um, some changes in our own lives to help save the earth. So uh, I'm gonna go through all 10, but I'd really like this to be a discussion. So we will, um, um, the start. So the, the first thing is um, conserving water. And little things make a difference, you know, like turning off the water when you're brushing your teeth, <laughs> which hopefully all of us are doing. Or if you have a leaky faucet, you know, a leaky faucet can lose up to 90 gallons of water per day. Yeah. Uh, one I added was uh, water the lawn less. No, you don't. Um, and that translates to mowing less. So it's kind of a win-win where we're not creating that air pollution from mowing our lawn because it's not growing as fast. So um, don't ever mow. I don't ever water my lawn. Do other people water, water their lawn? lawn? Yeah. <laughs> I never do. <laughs> um, any other ideas about conserving water or things that you are doing at home? Well, now that we are washing our hands for 20 seconds, uh, you put the soap on, turn off the water. <laughs> I know I've been right. okay, and I needed that because oh, yeah. I've been I've been probably letting it run. I was I said to Ron, I think the water is <laughs> we're using more water because of all this hand are. washing. That's a great idea, and I hadn't even thought well, of that because I just let the water run. But it might oh, okay. be where you do it too, like this. You know, some yeah. of our faucets are easier to control. Lori? You know, with the... Yeah, I have a question on that because to me, it's keeping your hands under the water for 20 seconds, not just rubbing it with soap for 20 seconds. Well, I thought it well, was it's, rubbing it with soap a, for 20 seconds. Yeah, because if you're under the water, you're rinsing off the soap. Yeah, well, I didn't think soap was the issue. I thought it was getting the germs off your hands for 20 seconds with running water. So my understanding is the virus is covered with a, a fat and the soap... Right. You no, know, it's a lipid. So the soap destroys the lipid, the fat. So it's the soap actually that kills the virus. I want to hear Karen's word. Go ahead, Karen. You're the biologist here. I said it emulsifies the fat. So it breaks it up, pulls it apart. The soap does. Yeah. Yeah. Changes the uh, uh, polar part of the molecule. So they push apart. Yes. basically so we might be able to run the water for a couple seconds at the beginning and the end so instead of doing 20 seconds of water we're doing six or something <laughs> or five nancy nancy you'll be surprised how soapy soap can get when you soak <laughs> for 20 seconds in water. it's true and the other thing away is always wet your hands with water before you put the soap on yeah yeah. Yeah. One thing I've started doing, especially in the summer, and when I rinse off vegetables or fruits that I buy at the store or grow in the garden, I have a dishpan under that and I capture that water and use it to water the plants sure. that need water, cool. either in the house or out of the house. Yeah. Well, what we've started to do on that issue. You know, sometimes you want to wash with hot water, and so, but it's not hot for like the first 20 seconds, is we just have like a watering can nearby. So when we're heating up the water to have warm water, you just direct it into a watering can, which can then be used outside later. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. If you want to wash with warm water, yeah. if you don't care, then it doesn't matter. Something else that can help is uh, using a rain barrel, putting a rain barrel up and then using that water for watering vegetables and other things in your yard. So you're not using 
the tap water and it's not running down the street and picking up pollutants and running into the, the river. So yeah, one and the other thing that I think I mean we don't have a rain barrel. We've talked about it enough yeah. times. We haven't, but using native plants too is a way to um, you get a lot of different benefits with that. But the one of the big benefits is that they're adapted to our climate and so they take typically take less water than um, things that are not native in our area. Another thing I think we can do is don't run your dishwasher or your laundry machine until you have a full load. Yeah. Unless you've got to get it done. Right. <laughs> but you can condense those. Mm -hmm. okay. I kind of noticed where I live that a lot of people because I've they're elderly more el they're more they're older than I am and I, and they do a lot more laundry it seems like and I think part of that is it's kind of this is one of the few things they can control in life right now no. that but I sure agree with just doing it when you have a full load but yeah well when you buy your appliance too it can make a difference when we bought a front loader they said it used I don't know less soap and less water. Yeah. Oh, and it adjusts to the size of the load, so it's pretty minimal water usage. Other ideas? A front loader is that more. Yeah, yeah the front a front loading machine uses less water. At least the one we have. Okay. Do we remember our brand? I, <laughs> I might have to go look. What is Sears? <laughs> no, no, we bought it from Hirsch. Oh yeah. That was the first one from Sears. Yeah. So another, another thing kind of tied with the wash machine is the dryer. If we could hang things outside instead of always using the dryer, that would save some electricity. Right. Mm -hmm. Or gas, whichever you're using, right? Yeah. Uh, right. So yesterday is, yesterday's wind uh, made putting clothes out of the dryer, it was fresh air, and in about <laughs> 25 minutes, our clothes were dry. Wow. Nice. Yesterday. Uh -huh. so this is we fun. almost lost a couple of clothes and went. <laughs> yeah. So, um, number two, be car conscious. So if you stay off the road two days a week, throughout the whole year, you can reduce emissions by about, 1600 pounds of carbon dioxide that is i believe a year um, so some of the things you can do i mean just be uh, think about when you're running errands combine errands so that you're only heading out once and instead of five times during the week you can head out once or twice um, continue to um, those of you that are still working um, can you know, maybe you're safer at home, you can <laughs> telework at home. Maybe you can see if you can continue doing that. Um, maintaining your car at, you know, being efficient, um, particularly keeping the tires up can save, make it 3% more efficient. Um, and consider buying an electric or, or a hybrid car. So I know Tom McNeely, who is a member of the, the team, just got uh, an electric car. Uh, Tesla and Mark. So he, and part of our uh, initial plans was that Tom was going to give people a, a little ride in his car <laughs> as part of Earth Day, but uh, obviously that's not happening today. So he's convinced that you can find good deals on used electric cars too. Yeah. So I, I know he's shared that before. It's really interesting right now that with the Safer at Home, there's a great uh, improvement in air quality in several major cities and like 30% drop in emissions and so it that's another thing I mean there's so many learning opportunities it's a it's a terrible time but there's so many learning opportunities like Karen was saying you know you can make some changes for the common good um, you know, everybody's out walking more. Maybe, maybe Ron and I'll actually get ourselves to walk to Prince of Peace one of these days. We've ridden our bikes a few yeah. times, but you know, we it would be good for us and it would be good for the planet. 
Any other ideas, thoughts? We have a daughter who lives in the Boston area and one of the last phone calls we had with her, she said, the Boston streets are empty. <laughs> People use them for walking here in Boston and they're empty. Yeah. yeah. If you've ever been to Boston, the streets are not empty. Yeah. <laughs> right. And to see them empty is astonishing. Yeah. Yeah, it's like that all over the world. So, so uh, number three is walk, bike, oh, yeah. <laughs> or take public transportation. So, uh, you know, walking and biking um, are ways to reduce greenhouse gases. Uh, plus, it's good, good exercise. Um, taking a bus or carpooling, um, you know, even one time can, can make a difference. So. So I, I want to make a comment on that is that when you can support uh, biking lanes and sidewalks and things like that, you know, do that because we live near the Fox River Mall and to bike or walk there is taking your life in your hands because it's yes. not good yes. uh, access for that. Yep. And uh, so that's a way we can, um, you know, we can support or promote uh biking lanes and sidewalks and things like yeah. that. I'm, we're right with you there, uh, Chris. We used to live in a neighborhood with sidewalks and then we moved to a neighborhood without sidewalks. And it's not bad in the summer, but in the winter, like when we'd walk our dog and there's, you know, the street narrows with the snow and it's icy, it's just scary. And, and the closest grocery store in our neighborhood now is Festival and to get across CE is, from where we live north of CE and to get across that six lanes, even with the roundabout, it is very scary. <laughs> I you find got, it you anyway. Gotta, you gotta pick the right time of day to yeah, try to do it. It's, so. it's not pedestrian yeah. and bike friendly. But I can imagine trying to get over the Fox River Mall from where you are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I have been trying to get out on my bike more in the last couple of years and um, I do find the bike lanes that are going in very helpful. So, yeah. And I, I think there is um, a pretty strong movement to try to keep that going in the Fox Valley, at least in Appleton. I don't know about Grand Chute. So, well, and maybe, maybe pedestrian, you know, like some places where there's a pedestrian bridge. You know, I mean, some of the places are really going to be hard to put a bike lane. You know what I mean? The speed of the traffic on certain, you know, like on CE, that's 40 or 45 there, isn't it? Yeah. By, by festival. And so it might be a pedestrian bridge that has to, that might be an easier solution. I don't know. Expensive, I'm sure. I think. And, that, any other thoughts? Are you aware of the tunnel underneath by the Y? Ah, I yeah. have gone over there before. Yeah, we've, yeah. Yep, I have done that. Um, that was before the roundabout went in. It was really crazy. And I went over to that tunnel. I actually have found with the roundabout, it's a little easier to get across that intersection. So. Mm -hmm. I'd four. get extra exercise if I went all the way over the tunnel. <laughs> there you go. Good idea, Lori. I could use it. <laughs> reuse, reuse and recycle. So reduce, use uh, less single-use products like paper products, paper plates, paper bags, use single-use plastic bags, and even utensils. Um, use more reusable products um, like food storage containers. I know Nancy has a friend that when she goes out to a more of a fast food restaurant, brings along her own utensils, so she's not using the, the plastic <laughs> utensils. Old high school friend, right? Um, we'll do that with their coffee or drinks, too. They bring their own mug. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah we do that when yeah, we're traveling. I, I try to do that, right. And um, recycle, keep all materials that can be recycled out of the garbage. So um, that's... There's been discouraging uh, publicity lately about how little of our plastic is actually getting recycled. So if you can reduce the plastic, I think that's... Uh, we need to do plastic surgery, don't we? Cut it out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, 
Right. Think, That's um, a good one. Number 10 on this slide is talks about plastics. So we'll get a chance to talk about plastics again. Plastic surgery. I like that, yeah, Karen. That would be surgery. a good article <laughs> for the... Well, I don't... I, I, reuse is like right now, you can redeem yourself as a pack rat if you can re I'm reusing all these fabric scraps. I had no idea why I was keeping them and they're now being turned into face masks. So. <laughs> I know in the in the kitchen I it's have been one that usually just went and grabbed a plastic bag to put things in and I have been constantly trying to get better at getting something that is uh, more reusable a container to put food things in before it goes into the refrigerator so you can buy little uh, wax paper bags that have a little strip you pull off and sticky right hold over to close it. I often wonder what did we do before we had plastic? Yeah. 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 But people survived. Yep. Very much so. And Nancy and I have gone to washing some plastic bags so we can reuse them mm -hmm. and or washing them and then recycling them. So mm -hmm. not just throwing them into the garbage. Other thoughts? Use the, uh, just, uh, just a reminder to use the recycling opportunities like at grocery stores uh, for those plastic bags. Some, yeah. you know, they inevitably end up in your house somehow, uh, but that's, mm -hmm. you know, just a reminder that those are there. Yep. Rather than putting them into your community recycling bin, they, because they don't want them. Right. I know Jessica is always reminding us of that, not <laughs> them to the, but take them to the grocery store and recycle them, like Kathy That's said. Good. So, um, composting, give it a try. Organic materials in the landfills mm -hmm. produce the greenhouse gas methane, which is a pretty powerful greenhouse gas that traps heat. So, um, if you haven't already, you might consider doing some composting. You know, a lot of the clean kitchen vegetable waste from the kitchen can be composted, as well as the uh, yard waste around the yard that, that you have. Um, and then it can not only help save the planet, but it makes a natural fertilizer that you can use in your yard. Um, I have a pretty large composting station in our backyard that I compost things from the yard and then during the uh, the non-frozen time of the year we compost things from the kitchen back there and um, yesterday I was spreading all over my little vegetable garden to help get things to grow there so. What do you mean by clean kitchen vegetable? Um, things that don't have oil and salt and meat in them yeah so. Uh, Ron, can you share with us as to uh, some things you learn about composting kitchen things, uh, kitchen vegetable peelings, like does it draw animals or does it draw have make an odor or recommendation? Yeah. Or what kind of a bin you have? So what I have, I actually have um, an area that's eight feet by eight feet and I have um, um, <laughs> treated, treated timber on the sides of it, the, the kind of a bin, and then that's where I pile things up and I can turn the pile over, but you can get um, plastic. plastic containers. Here's plastic again, but it's um, something you can reuse that you can put kitchen scraps in so that you can turn it over. And um, mm. yeah. I think if you have one of those bins, it, you have to do some aerating so there's little yeah. like yeah. things you can put down in them. Are, Ron's the composter. He's. A, <laughs> I'm. I'm still learning. I can't get a good hot pile, which is pretty important. But you um, don't want to put in any seeds or nuts. I think that will draw rodents. Yeah. Yeah. So. I know the uh, University of Ma um, Wisconsin Extension has some yeah. good information on composting, so you may want to um, go to their website and you know Google that and. You can probably get some good handouts on composting. So I just love it that he does the composting because 
when I'm working in my flower beds, all I need to do is go get a, go get some finished compost and not have to worry about buying fertilizer. It's, you know, and I know what's, what I'm putting into the area too. The one thing I haven't really done and figure out how to do is the compost or kitchen stuff during the winter. So yeah. did, did anybody do that? We just do our coffee grounds. Yeah. So yeah, I, I still throw my stuff in the composting bin and I don't do a good job of maintaining it, but it still gives me what I need in the spring. But I right. still front yeah. out there in the winter and toss it in. Good for Excellent. you. Yeah. It probably just sits there, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you have um, a, a bin that you put it into then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've been thinking to get in a bin that I could do that with instead of just throwing it on top of the pile out in the yard. So. Because I find if I, um, like I put a pumpkin there and in November after things freeze, after Halloween, the deer come up and eat it. So <laughs> there are wildlife that are yeah, we have interested if you leave it out and expose. So. Yeah. If they eat the pumpkin, then they don't eat all our trees and shrubs. <laughs> <laughs> They're very, very hungry. They've been eating, a, uh, we bought a native climbing rose that has the biggest thorns and they're, it's been eaten yeah, just in the last week. <laughs> Any other thoughts on composting? I thought, Ron, you were going to say that the pumpkin was um, recyclable and you could use it again next year. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't figured that one out yet, Ella. <laughs> Maybe it's recyclable as a pie. You can make a pie. Yeah. Of it. <laughs> in, a, in a new form, in a new way. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> it would recycle by growing a new one from the seeds. And yeah. the there you go. <laughs> so, Actually, if we, uh, go ahead. No, what was Karen going to say? What were we going to say, Karen? I was going to say if you have kids at home, you could involve them in the project of composting and they could do a mini compost. Mm. Just in a big soda bottle or something, you know, cut off the top and monitor what they put in. And you can actually weigh worms and they'll gain weight with time eating this stuff. Huh. <laughs> and they'll reproduce too, you know. So, yeah. Anyway, you can involve children in this. Yeah. Great idea. Activity, or grandchildren. Yeah. So switch to LEDs, switch over light bulbs in the house to light emitting diode LED bulbs, um, save energy and money on the electric bill. Um, the CFLs, which are the compact fluorescent bulbs, are more efficient than the incandescent bulbs and last up to 10 times longer, but the LED bulbs are way more efficient than the compact fluorescent bulbs. Um, they last up to 25,000 hours, which, you know, for a lot of us, it's a one-time investment because you may not be using it that long. Yeah. Has anybody found one that, that they felt was like a nice warm light? <laughs> I always liked, like, the in the um, incandescent ones, I always liked the true color kind. And it's just... I have to say, I think that's the hardest thing with the LED bulbs is finding one that the light isn't yeah. real cool or harsh. Yeah. Nancy, the, the place when we redid our kitchen, we got new lighting for in there. And the bulbs that I got um, from the lighting people, um, they were a little bit more pricey, but they are definitely warm. They're not, they're not that same blue light kind of thing. Yeah, see if you can find out the... The brand or the I will. I'll write it down for you. Like, or it's just I think that's yeah what makes it hard. You know, I'll the, let you know. You can't the uh, the compact fluorescents are not as big a change. You raise a good point, Nancy. That there have been some studies out there. We haven't really researched it a lot, but you have to be a little cautious. Um, there are some folks. <clears throat> that it can affect their eyes mm -hmm. um, in different ways, um, physiologically. Mm. Uh, we don't know the details, but it can cause some people headaches. Mm -hmm. uh, it, can, it, it can have some issues when you're not giving your eye the full spectrum of light. Right. Oh. Um, and it's a very real issue. Um, in fact, you could be, you just have to be cautious of that. Yeah. Hmm. 
I didn't realize that. Right. Which is part of what you're saying by the coldness. Your eye is saying something that this isn't kind of what it's used to. You know, if you look outside, you see, in fact, we're looking outside right now on our patio and it's beautiful and it, it's warm looking. But if we turn on an LED um, cold light, of which we try to be careful with what we purchase, um, it's different. It's not as friendly. Huh, I thought it was just an aesthetic thing. That's interesting. Yeah. So Nancy and I uh, went down to the Garden Expo in Madison in early February, and we got captivated by a um, hydroponic, where you can do hydroponics in your basement. In a mason jar. In a mason jar. <laughs> but anyway, wow. we've got a light that is an LED, but it's a full spectrum of light so that, that plants can grow. So it's you know low energy, but it is providing. So they can make mm. the LEDs with a fuller spectrum of light, like you were saying. So. Okay. Do you have information, Ron, on that light? Yeah, yeah. the happy leaf? Yep, yep. Happy leaf, write it that down. It sounds like happy that's an uh, uh, exchange of information the team could help people with, maybe. Yeah. Because Nancy, the name of those light bulbs are called Satco. And they actually, on the bottom of the box, they have a little sliding scale that shows you the yellow versus the white. Yeah. Like can, soft white, they have a sliding scale so you can get them in different yeah. different kinds. So Trisha, so, put, put that in the chat box. So we have I will do that. Filling. Okay, sounds good. Were you successful with hydroponics? What's the question? Were you successful? Have you, have you done any hydroponics? Um, we just started the seeds about three weeks ago, and, and um, the, uh, the, uh, the lettuce is up about this high right now. So, um, cool. and, yeah, it's fun. Yeah. So, <laughs> no rabbit. So we're, uh, you know, we probably won't get more than a meal or two out of, out of it, but um, well, I think it's still it fun. It depends on how you harvest it. Yeah. We put in arugula and kale and lettuce, some basil, parsley. parsley. Yeah. yeah. Can do about eight jars under this little 17 inch long light. Yeah. We put in a energy efficient light near our bed tables, which is a, a night in sleep inducing light. Apparently oh. it's something similar they use for astronauts to get them in a day night cycle. Right. So it's definitely a lower and more yellow warm light but has anyone else add that or use that oh. Karen, what was you the, that Karen, you'll have to find find the brand for us i'd have to look into sure. it i'd have to take a bulb out i think and look yeah. sure so we I've can had it for a number of years but we can note this as something that sounds like that would be really useful information to share with a lot of people at church. Yeah. yeah, you if you read by it, they say for 20, 30 minutes, it helps get you into a restful sleep cycle. Interesting. Hmm. So live energy wise, make your home more energy efficient. Um, windows are responsible for 25 to 35 percent of home heat loss, mm -hmm. which I didn't realize it was that much. We got Pretty old windows in our house. Yeah. Um, so consider replacing. Uh, proper insulation obviously adds more in, uh, as as needed. Increases the R value, which is the insulation value. Um, tuning up your heating and air conditioning can make it more um, efficient. Putting in a programmable thermostat obviously saves can save energy by um, automatically reducing the uh, the energy needs of the house. So, any thoughts on that? Things people are doing? Mm -hmm. For the most part, what we find ourselves doing, and of course we love the out of doors, but we just turn the heater off <laughs> at night. And the lowest we've gotten down to is about 54, 53. Uh, the next day, and it's kind of funny, about a year ago, we were reading an article that said, that was trying to encourage people to turn it down to 64. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that's our starting point. Yeah. Yeah. It's, but it, it's kind of interesting that if we turn it off on a cold, cold winter day, it only gets down to maybe 50, 
four, fifty-five. Yeah. And so it's a little chilly, but then you work it over, you know, then you yeah. turn it on in the morning and you're good to go. Uh, if you like breathing cool, refreshing uh, air. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have our heat go down to 58 at night, I believe. Yeah. So. That's the usual temperature that it drops to. But yeah. on a cold, cold night, it drops yeah. lower. Yeah. yeah. But then here's a question then. I've always wondered about that because I'm wondering then when you turn it on in the morning, is it just on for longer yeah. to heat the house back up again? So are you defeating the whole purpose? No. That's a question. I don't know the answer. No, it's if you think about it, when you think about how much heat is lost out of your home, um, what we find is that we can restore the heat in the home um, about every 10 minutes, it goes up a degree. So within an hour, we're up six degrees. And Ron, you were saying it drops to 58. So we're back up to 64, 65 in, in less than an hour. So essentially, we have not used heat for 12 hours. At okay. all yeah. That wow. makes sense. In, in terms of the, some of the engineering behind it, that heat travels faster out of a house the warmer the house is. Oh, really? So, in other words, and so the heat, it's, it's, a, it's oh. a simple graph if you look at it. Huh. And so if, if you have your house at 80, you're going to lose way, way more than if it's at 75. Mm. But way, way more uh, than those five degrees compared to 75 and 70. So every, the hotter your house is, the far more energy flow out of the house. Oh, I didn't really say that. that. That's interesting, Alan. Yeah. I'd like to read about that. Yeah. Right. Absolutely, yeah. That's so really, the, the cooler expensive. you can keep your house, the better. Yeah. Sure. Just a funny story. When we had, um, I think when we first lived in Appleton and we didn't have much money, um, uh, one of our kids was a baby and I went and said, you know, we're keeping our house at 62 during the day. We don't keep it that cool anymore. 62 during the day and 55 at night. And I said, is this, this can't be good for the baby, right? I wanted, <laughs> I, wanted support I was, ba to turn I was baking constantly, partly to stay warm. And, and the doctor said, oh, fine. It's no problem. Just put an extra layer of clothes on that. <laughs> Sure. So I have to say I'm a little wimpier than I was uh, than I we've been keeping 67 at our house. Yeah. But we're, that, we're, that's we're, perfectly comfortable, especially when you're moving. Even if I have a layer on, I often have to shed it if I'm doing something active. All right, um, number eight: eat sustainable foods. So how we eat actually can make a difference um, on your carbon footprint. Um, Large-scale food production accounts for about 25% of the greenhouse gases, and a lot of that's in, mm -hmm. you know, large-scale animal husbandry, dairy, and uh, and cattle. So um, I think I kind of listed the list of how to eat sustainably in in the order where you can have the, the greatest impact. And obviously, growing your own vegetables is going to have pretty much zero impact as far as um, creating a carbon footprint, but then choosing food from farms that aim to conserve natural resources and soil, um, and usually small organic farms are a good choice for that. Um, buy local from local farms, it reduces the transportation needs for that. Uh, eat crops that are in season, so change what you're eating during the year. Um, you know, eat things that don't need to be preserved, but you can eat them when they're fresh and good. Um, eat whole grain, fresh vegetables and fruits, but eat less red meat and processed foods, which are gonna consume or create more greenhouse gas, so. Thoughts? Comments? 10 after 12. Yeah. You're doing thought for food instead of food for thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So number nine is put her in charge of marketing. Yeah. Really <laughs> Plant a tree or two. Um, a UN report in 2018 suggested that additional two and a half billion acres of forest, which sounds like a lot of forest, but certainly doable, would limit global warming to 2.7 degrees by 2000. 
50. And um, the idea is that trees are great at taking carbon dioxide out of the air. Through the process of photosynthesis, they're taking that carbon dioxide, creating wood and sugars out of it and putting it in. Um, and so a young tree, you know, as you can see, consumes about 13 pounds of carbon dioxide per year, where a, a 10 year old, 48 pounds, and the older it gets, the more that it's, it's going to be producing. So consider planting a tree or two more in your yard. <laughs> And then the, uh, the last thing is um, give up plastic. And I was astounded when I read this, that um, 1 million plastic drinking bottles are bought every minute oh in the God. world, 1 million. Yeah, 5 trillion single-use plastic bags are used every year, 5 trillion, that's a lot. And the sad part is only about 9% of that plastic gets recycled. So, mm. um, and unfortunately, it's about 8 million tons of it that ends up in the oceans every year, which causes huge issues with marine life. Um, so as much as you can, say no to plastic. And we kind of talked about that already. Um, you know, getting away from plastic, um, use more shopping bags, reusable bottles, reusable food containers, cups, straws, and... Uh, and as uh, I think Kathy pointed out, recycle those bags at, at the local grocery store and not in the community recycling bin. So, so um, you know, I, I looked at a number of other um, sources of 10 things you could do to um, help save the earth. And on a number of, on at least uh, one or two of them that I saw, one of the things that's on, basically on those was, um, like we could add a number 11 here would be to advocate, you know, yeah. get involved and um, advocate on uh, local government, state government, and national government, and even, um, you know, the advocate by the how you consume goods yeah. can be an advocation too. So, well, and if you communicate with companies, you know, yeah, 